another hazard that volcanoes uh, have is the pyroclastic hazards. And uh, there are many different hazards that pyroclastics pose to people. First of all, we have ash fall, which uh, you can also call fallout. And this is simply when you have a large explosive eruption and the ash goes up in the atmosphere, well, eventually it's going to fall out of the atmosphere. It's going to cover all kinds of stuff. And all of that ash falling out of the atmosphere, depending on how thick it is, uh, it can destroy vegetation. And it can also the, collapse the roofs of houses because uh, imagine you get a few feet of basically rock landing on the roof of your house. The roof is not made to support that kind of weight and it can, uh, can ultimately uh, collapse the house. Ash in the atmosphere also causes respiratory problems. Remember, I said ash is little shards of volcanic glass. If we look at ash under a microscope, this is a scanning electron microscope image of ash, look at those sharp edges. Now, it is bad to inhale any kind of particulate matter into your lungs. It's worse when it has really, really sharp edges like that and can actually lacerate and cut up your lungs. So you can have um, some uh, um, bad respiratory problems from that. And that's why this guy here, notice he has a, uh, a dust mask and in fact goggles on so he doesn't get the ash in his eyes as well. And by the way, that is daytime during a volcanic eruption. Uh, ash can also have an impact on air traffic. So the uh, uh, jet engines of airplanes runs at about the temperature where ash melts. And airplanes can be flying through the atmosphere and they might not even know they're flying through an ash cloud because um, it's not real thick. There's just a little bit of the ash in the atmosphere and that ash can then uh, melt on the engine, on the turbine of the jet engine, and this can cause the engines to fail. And uh, back in the 1980s, there were two airplanes that almost crashed, one in Alaska and one that was flying over Indonesia, I believe. And uh, both of them almost crashed, they had very good pilots who managed to save them. Uh, because those airplanes ended up flying through, uh, just like I said, not, they didn't even know they were flying through volcanic ash, but it was just enough that it caused the engines to fail. And so today we have what are called volcanic ash advisory centers. And these volcanic ash advisory centers make sure that this doesn't happen to the airplanes. This is the inside of one of those flights that went through the volcanic ash cloud and you can see the ash that has melted onto that engine. And so these um, uh, centers basically monitor the airspace in different parts of the world and if say we have uh, a volcanic ash cloud going over this area, air traffic would be diverted around that to prevent any kind of accidents from happening. Ash, when it gets into the stratosphere, can also affect Earth's climate system. We saw this after Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991. This is a temperature record, and we can see here's kind of the temperature. Then we have the eruption, and notice the average global temperature drops. Um, average global temperature dropped something like half a degree Celsius, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that is the 20th century warming. Um, but it dropped about half a degree Celsius for something like three to five years after the eruption. All right, other things. Oh, oh, um, yeah, other things that pyroclastics can cause. I mentioned that pyroclastic flow. Now, pyroclastic flow is also called a nuée ardente. I do realize I misspelled that. There should be an E there. But uh, nuée ardente in French means glowing cloud. Because if you see one of these in nighttime, it actually has a glow to it. And this is a turbulent cloud of gas and pyroclastics that races down the side of a volcano. And these are some of the uh, 
most frightening and most deadly aspects of volcanoes. These things are very, very hot, up to 1,000 degrees Celsius. They can be very fast, up to 450 miles per hour. And they can travel, they can do pretty much whatever they want. They can travel far from the volcano, you know, 70 kilometers from the volcano. They can go over hills. They can go over water. In fact, when, um, um, uh, uh, gosh, volcano in 1883 erupted in the Sunda Straits, Krakatoa. Yeah, Krakatoa. When Krakatoa erupted in 1883, uh, it, it was an island sitting in the middle of the Sunda Straits. And it had pyroclastic flows that flowed as much as 30 kilometers across water, hit the neighboring islands, and killed a bunch of people there. So these pyroclastic flows are just, they're, they're terrifying but amazing. This is what one looks like. We have it coming off the volcano there, and all of this gray you see is this mix of hot gas and pyroclastics. And only one person has ever survived being hit by a pyroclastic flow, and that's this guy here. And um, this is uh, Louis Auguste Sipari, and um, back in the early 1900s, um, he was uh, in, I think it's Martinique, and um, Pele erupted, and uh, Pele had a big pyroclastic flow that like took out an entire city, but he was in jail. And um, uh, jail was actually more like a dungeon. It was kind of underground with big, thick stone walls, one tiny little window. And uh, when the pyroclastic flow came, it took out the entire city, uh, but he ended up being protected by the, the thick stone walls and the fact he was kind of half underground. Uh, he did get burned. The side of him that was facing the, the tiny window was burned by the intense heat of that pyroclastic flow. Um, and so anyway, uh, when ships arrived, like the day after the volcanic eruption, to find, uh, this was a port city, and they found all the destruction. You're like, what the hell's going on here? And um, he was, of course, yelling and screaming to let him out of uh, jail. And uh, they let him out, and he spent the rest of his days touring with Barnum and Bailey Circus as the man who survived the pyroclastic flow. Uh, so he's the only person um, in history that we know of to ever survive the full-on um, force of a pyroclastic flow because he was in jail. I just thought that's interesting. Uh, so let's take a look at what one of these pyroclastic flows looks like. This one's going to be from uh, 1997, and I picked this one because uh, it shows the flow going over water. So, there we have it. All of this is the pyroclastic flow. There you can see it traveling over water, and it can do that because uh, it has such low density, it's very buoyant, and so it can just skim across the water. Uh, it's bad news for anything that's swimming around in the water there, uh, basically because it is so hot it will start boiling the water that's under it. So if you saw the second Jurassic World where they're like underwater in, and the pyroclastic flows like over them, they're toast. I'm sorry, they boil. So Hollywood got it wrong. Not for the first time. Alright, so how do we get these incredibly scary pyroclastic flows. Well, there's four basic ways that pyroclastic flows are formed. One way is from an eruption column collapse. Basically, the volcano blasts all this ash and pyroclastics upwards, then gravity takes hold and pulls it down and creates the flow. That's like what ended up burying Pompeii when Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD. You can also have lava domes collapsing. And that's where a piece of the lava dome breaks off, 
the pressure that was holding in all the gas and pyroclastics is reduced. So those explode outwards, creating um, a pyroclastic flow. This happened at Mount Unzen in Japan in 1991 to 1994. There were several hundred pyroclastic flows as a dome would build up, break, have a pyroclastic flow, and then would build up again, break, have another pyroclastic flow. You can have what's called low pressure boil over. And uh, this is where there's just enough pressure to kind of heave this stuff out of, the, uh, out of the, the volcano without having an upward eruption column. And that's what happened in Pele in 1902. That's what the uh, one guy survived. And then we have the directed blast, also called a lateral blast. And this comes from the side of the volcano. This is like what happened in Mount St. Helens in 1980. So instead of the, the lava going upwards to the normal vent of the volcano, um, the lava actually got diverted to the side of the volcano and ended up blasting out the side. And we can see each one of those here, right? Here's the eruption column collapse. There's the lateral blast going outwards. There's the over spilling the, the crater rim. And then there's the dome collapse. When you get these explosions, they can have quite catastrophic results. This is uh, results of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. This is actually uh, like 30 years after the eruption, and you can still see all the trees that were blasted downwards. But those pyroclastic flows eventually are going to end. It's not like they flow forever and ever and ever. Eventually, those gases that are propelling the flow cool down and dissipate, and everything that was being carried in that big gray pyroclastic flow gets dropped off. And this is a pyroclastic flow deposit. So inside there, you would have all these like little pumice pieces and ash and so on. Uh, here's a special pyroclastic flow deposit. This pyroclastic flow went through a forest and it was so hot it basically carbonized the trees. So the force of it kind of blasted the trees apart and the heat of it carbonized and instantly turned the wood into charcoal and that's what we see stuck in this pyroclastic flow deposit right there. All right, last of the th ways that volcanoes, well, kind of almost, not really last. One of the last ways volcanoes try to kill you is with toxic gases. Toxic gases can cause asphyxiation. That's where they push oxygen away so you have no oxygen to breathe. Or they can cause poisoning. That's where your body actually absorbs some of the gases to some sort of detrimental effect. Now, common gases in the volcano, water vapor is not hazardous. Carbon dioxide, though, can collect in low-lying areas and cause asphyxiation. This actually happened at Lake Neos in Cameroon in uh, 1986, I think it was. Sulfur dioxide can cause acid rain. Sulfur aerosols in the atmosphere can actually cause climate change. It can cool Earth's climate. And then here's one gas that's not one of the most common, but you do get it in some volcanoes. Hydrogen fluoride, HF, it can cause something called fluorosis. And fluorosis is where um, you absorb enough fluorine into your body, or animals can absorb enough fluorine into their body, that um, it disrupts proper bone growth, something like that, and causes extreme pain and ultimately death. So examples, Lockie in 1783 caused fluorosis in some of the population, and Lake Neos in 1986 had this carbon dioxide accumulating in valleys and uh, asphyxiated several hundred people. And again, that's where the gases come out of a volcano. Or here, this it, Kilauea doesn't look like this anymore since the 2018 eruption, but it used to have a big lava lake here that was emitting 
huge amounts of sulfur dioxide and you actually couldn't go to this part of the volcano or the general public couldn't go to that part of the volcano and um, as scientists we couldn't go to that part of the volcano without special breathing apparatus um, because it's not good to breathe a whole lot of sulfur dioxide. All right, um, other hazards, tsunami. Big volcanic eruptions can cause tsunami. This did happen in Krakatoa in 1883. We have an entire lecture on tsunami in a little bit, so we'll talk more about it at that time. And then there's climate change, which I was alluding to a little bit earlier with the sulfur gases and the ash. Ash in the atmosphere blocks incoming sunlight, cooling the climate. The same thing can be caused by sulfur aerosols. Sulfur aerosols are where sulfur gases and water combine with each other. Blocks incoming sunlight, cools Earth's climate system. Now, especially in the past, when you didn't have kind of a global supply chain of food, cooling the climate just a little bit could cause major famine. We actually saw that when Rinjani erupted in 1257. 40 cubic kilometers of ash erupted in the atmosphere. Just to give you an idea of the size of that, Mount St. Helens was not quite one cubic kilometer in 1980. This one was 40. So this was a lot bigger eruption. And um, this ash then circled the globe, cooled the climate system. You can see 15,000 people of the 50,000 that lived in London at that time died from starvation simply because the climate was so much cooler. It snowed every month of the year in England. Crops wouldn't grow and the population starved. And that was a serious thing when you have big enough eruptions like that that can disrupt the climate system. All right, so obviously we want to be able to figure out when is one of these eruptions going to happen because these eruptions can be devastating even if they're not deadly even if they're just one of those effusive eruptions like in Hawaii if you have a home that's going to be in the pathway of that lava flow you want to know in plenty of time so you can get as much of your possessions and things out of the way so volcanologists can look at many different things to forecast eruptions. And I want you to realize there's not really one magical piece of data that we use to figure out when an eruption is going to happen. We can't be like, we need this one thing and then we know. It's actually multiple lines of evidence working together give us a good picture of what's going on in the volcano and let us figure out when it might erupt. One of the things we look at is seismic activity, earthquake activity. Earthquakes, when you have magma rising, get progressively shallower because that magma coming to the surface is what's causing the earthquakes. But you also get earthquakes that are very different from, let's say, your tectonic earthquakes. You get these things called low frequency or LP earthquakes and these are caused by magma movement. Also caused by magma movement are something called harmonic tremors. So this looks like my handwriting. Okay now actually well it might be a little better than my handwriting but let's take a look at what we're seeing right here. Um, we can have this is a typical like tectonic high frequency earthquake. This is one of those low frequency earthquakes. See how it looks different? That's magma moving. These squiggles, like these, that's harmonic tremors. That's also magma moving. And so these things are telling us magma is moving underneath that volcano. So we can look for those special types of earthquakes there. Now another thing that gives us a clue that something's happening in the volcano is ground deformation. So we might have the original surface right here, but as magma is being injected, as magma is rising upwards, that can move the surface of the volcano. And what we can do is install tilt meters, which are exactly what it sounds like. They're a little uh, thing that measures that the ground is starting to tilt in a different way. We can also do just old-fashioned surveying to see how the land is changing. 
or we can use something called CGPS, continuous GPS, which basically just continuously measures the elevation of certain points on the volcano and lets us know if they are rising or falling or moving in some way as a result of the ground deforming there. Gas emissions are another important thing. Remember, those gases are the energy behind the volcanic eruption. And so we can then measure how much gas is being emitted from the volcano. We can do that with something called COSPEC, which is correlation spectrometer. This measures sulfur dioxide. You use something called LICOR, which measures carbon dioxide, or you can use this, the Fourier Transform Infrared Spectrometer that measures several gases simultaneously. It's also expensive, or at least it used to be. Um, what's neat about any of these gas emission things is you don't have to be right on top of the volcano to measure them. Uh, this is a COSPEC um, equipment, and you can set up a bit away from the volcano, and how it works, you shoot light into the atmosphere above the volcano, and your gases will absorb and reflect different wavelengths of light, and that what's absorbed and reflected and then comes back to you gives you an idea of how much gas is being emitted. You can also look at the water chemistry in areas. And this will include the temperature, the pH, um, oftentimes before volcanic eruptions, your um, pH will become more acidic. And you can look at dissolved gases. And that's exactly what's going on here. This is White Island in New Zealand, sampling the water there in order to uh, forecast what might occur at that volcano. We can also look at ground surface temperature. That one's pretty obvious. Like as magma gets closer to the surface, it's going to get hotter. What's kind of cool is you can measure this with satellites. So you don't even have to be on the volcano. You can be sitting in your pajamas in your office. You shouldn't be in your office in your pajamas, but you can be sitting at home in your pajamas and get this data off satellites. <coughs> and then this is a new one. This is something called infrasound. Um, as magma moves in under the volcano, um, sound waves that we can't hear, uh, sort of like, you know, dogs can hear certain sound waves we can't, well, the magma moving under the volcano can create these, like, sound waves that we can't hear, but we can put sensors in the ground that will listen to the volcano, and these sound waves tend to change as an eruption gets more imminent. Now this is brand new stuff. This has only been around, people have been working on this for just a few years. So this is one of those things that um, we're still perfecting how to use this when forecasting volcanic eruptions. But it's kind of interesting that we can almost listen to the volcano talking to us and telling us uh, what might be happening inside.